a hundred years ago, on December 10, 1878, Rajaji, or C.R., as most of us called Chakravarti Rajagopalachari, was born. He was born in a very poor family. His father earned five rupees a month. He rapidly rose to success as a lawyer. By the time he was 21, he had, in his own words, defended his first murderer. He was the first man in Salem, South India, to own a motor car. He became very successful, as I said. And then, equally rapidly, he accepted a voluntary decline in his standard of living as a result of his joining the national movement under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. In 1948, he became Governor General of India. In other words, he was Free India's first Indian head of state. And he occupied other high offices. He was very good in these responsible jobs, but equally impressive was the way in which he could shed these high offices, the peaceful way in which he could shed these offices. Most of us are aware that in the perspective of time, fame and success and achievement are not as significant as we think they are. Now, Rajaji was aware of this reality even at the climax of his success and his fame and his achievement. Uh, he died in December 1972. I was with him during the last days of his illness and I could see some of his qualities there. He was extremely courteous to the doctors, to the nurses, to the visitors. Uh, one doctor would ask him how he was and Rajaji was very frail, dying. I couldn't hear him. He would say, I beg your pardon, very politely. Another doctor would introduce himself. Rajaji would want to find out where he came from, exactly which part of Madras he came from, and so forth. Uh, he was under the drip treatment. There was a needle inserted in the vein of his left hand. Uh, and Rajaji was apt at times to want to touch that needle on the left hand. So he was cautioned not to do so. He said, yes, let not the right hand know what the left hand is doing. His wit was very famous. In the middle 30s, uh, Dr. Lohia, who was a member of the Congress Working Committee, and Rajaji was another member, uh, Dr. Lohia did not like a particular Congress policy. Dr. Lohia thought it was not radical enough. And he used very strong language. He said, I don't care a tuppence for this resolution. So Rajaji immediately interrupted and said, Lohia, you should swear in Russian currency. Uh, Rajaji had uh, a stubbornness of mind. He could stick very firmly to his ideas. But he also had a humbleness of heart. Now, this is the way I saw Rajaji. Uh, the way he was seen by some of the others who knew him was like this. It is difficult to talk of the many qualities of Rajaji. He was not only a politician, but a statesman. Beyond that, he was one of the wisest men that we produced before, that, that India produced before independence. His, uh, he not only was a freedom fighter, but he also devoted himself to Gandhiji's constructive program. He thought without that constructive program, the struggle for independence will not be a scheme and uh, will not bear fruit after independence. His greatest occupation was to, 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 to carry forward the message of the Chakha and Khadi to the villages. He was also greatly interested in uh, prohibition and in the removal of untouchability. My first meeting with Rajaji was when I was in London as High Commissioner. He was coming on his way to Washington 
to meet President Kennedy on behalf of the Gandhi Peace Foundation. His mission was to dissuade President Kennedy from carrying on with nuclear explosions. I met him with some misgivings because he was a very eminent man who had served practically every high office in our country, including that of Governor Jerusalem. But my misgivings were completely overcome when I have not actually met him. He was the soul of simplicity. He never tried to impress himself upon me. There was no patronage, no sense of condescension, no feeling that he was a big man talking to a comparatively young man who could not look back upon the distinguished past which he could. And he tried in the conversation which I had to gather from me about my impressions about America, because I had just come from being ambassador to the United States, and about President Kennedy, whom I also knew fairly well. His simplicity further struck me when I found that he had a very inquisitive mind and he wanted to gather as much knowledge as he could from me and there was very little that I could contribute to his knowledge because his fund of knowledge was immense. But wherever there was a lacuna in that fund, he wanted to fill up with what little I could contribute to that fund. The next time I met him was when I joined the cabinet. I went to Madras for some reason I don't remember, and he asked me to tea. And I went to the house of his host, who was Mr. Sridharvasan, and the famous Subalakshmi of Jawaharlal once called the Nightingale of India. I had to climb steps. In those days, I could climb steps. And I was taken to the hall where the tea was laid out. I said, where is Rajaji? He said, he is in the adjoining house. I said, I'll go down and see him. He can't come up. He said, no, Rajaji has given strict instructions. They would come to see me rather than I should go and see him. This again emphasized the greatness and the simplicity of the man. And he told me he was very distressed that I had joined the cabinet, because at that time he was a staunch opponent of the government. I told him that when the prime minister of the country invites you to do something, it is your duty to do it. But I assured him that if it came to a question of conscience, I would resign from the cabinet if I deferred for the majority. And I was true to my word and kept my faith with him because I resigned on the English issue, and he was very happy that I had done so. That was the last time I saw him. I may add that throughout the two interviews, I was struck by his tolerance of views other than his own. His, he was never self-righteous, self never about criticism, always willing to learn and be convinced that he might be wrong. Well, I was privileged to work very closely with Rajaji, as you know, for the last 10 years of his life. In my view, the thing that he stands out for is that he was a great dissenter. He, as you know, dissented against the Swaraj Party policies and was called a no-changer. Then again, when Quit India was on the anvil, as you know, he disagreed. But his biggest dissent was, of course, the establishment of the Swatantra Party in 1959, after which he led a regular crusade till the end against statism, or what we call the state capitalist system, where too much power is concentrated in the hands of the politicians and the government, both economic and political power, 
and the people lose their freedom of action and freedom of choice. Now, Rajaji advocated many things which unfortunately still have to be accomplished. The first was the dissolution of the National Planning Commission. The second was the removal of all the controls which he described as permit, license, quota, raj, as an evil. The third was the drastic reduction in taxation so that the men and the money could move and make the country strong. Now all that task that he prescribed still remains to be performed. And I frankly do not believe that unless these principles of Rajaji are adopted, there's very much hope for our country becoming more prosperous or our people becoming more happy. I think these are the sine qua non of progress. I think Rajaji is very relevant today, even in the changed conditions, because he pressed, or stressed two things which are still very important. The first is the place of dharma in our public life. It doesn't need any stressing on my part to say that dharma is conspicuously absent from the public life of the country in recent months and years. Secondly, to him all politics was a process of education. He was not interested in power, but in education. And he often stressed in the last years of his life that the role of the Swatantra Party was not to try and get to power somehow, as other parties might. But today the foundation or infrastructure of political education in a free society on which alone the structure of a democracy could be reared. So to me, Rajaji is extremely relevant today. And unless people turn back to him and to Mahatma Gandhi and the great teachings that they embodied, I feel our country will go on floundering as it has been doing in the last few years. Rajaji was unique, in my opinion. He was the only leader that I really ever accepted. He had so many facets to his character, his personality, that one had to be enchanted and completely absorbed and involved in whatever he said or did. I think that in this entire century, he was perhaps the only sage that we have had. I cannot think of a single piece of advice that he rendered, which if it had been accepted, would not have taken this country further along the road to progress. As far as his mind is concerned, I think it is today a legend. Even in his 90s, he was as clear-headed as anyone in his 40s and 50s. And as for the number of propositions that he could examine all at the same time and come to a conclusion, I don't think that there are many people in this world who had that sort of depth of thinking and understanding. Personally, I feel his, his absence tremendously because in a very real sense, he was like my second father to me. And particularly after my father died, I recall his blessing me and telling me that now I will have to don your father's mantle for you. And it was like that to the end of his life. It is men like Rajaji who really enrich a nation. And it is a shame that India as a nation has not understood the enrichment that it had in the form of Raja Gopalachari. I have not known Rajaji till I grew up and became somewhere about 19 or so. But later on, when I took my uh, uh, artistic work, took to my artistic work, he was slightly skeptical, but he was tremendously appreciated because he was very keen about the spiritual aspect of music or dance or whatever it may be. I began to get to know him very well Though previously he was a great friend of my 
husband, Dr. Arendale, whose centenary also we are celebrating. And uh, the, then afterwards, I had many, many occasions to consult him about many matters that were troubling me, even about my appointment to the uh, Rajya Sabha in Parliament. He was the first person I consulted whether I could be any use. And he said, of course, you can fight for the many, many things that are important to the country, for the women, and so on. Then I asked about the animals. He said, yes, you can fight for the cause of animals too. This makes you realize one aspect of his life which maybe others haven't mentioned. That is his great belief in, the, in kindness to animals and being against every form of cruelty to them and also in the vegetarian cause, which is essentially more kindness to animals rather than mere idea of diet. He was a very sympathetic man. That is what I found in my close relationship with him. And therefore, he acted as a kind of father and advisor and guide to many people in trouble. Sri Raja Gopal Achari was one of the most colorful and unique personality in Indian political life. He has a distinction of working in a very prominent role both before the independence and post-independence period. In the pre-independence period as a very close colleague of Mahatma Gandhi, whom he used to consider as keeper of his conscience, and also with a senior member of the working committee, he played a very important role in the freedom struggle. The constructive work in the field of Hadi and Hindi was a special contribution of his in those days. He fought many a battle on behalf of Gandhiji in the Order of Congress Committee during those days. He went to jail many times. In the post-independence period, he was one of our very few female leaders who took four steps in the process of consolidation of Indian independence, both as governor of Bengal and then as governor general, the last governor general of India, he made a unique contribution towards the consolidation of administration and carrying the flag of independence forward. He was a many splendid personality with a with a versatile, versatile mind. He was an author, a very skilled debater, a very fine conversationalist, a man very original in his thinking. I would like to say that he was one of the very few sharp intellectuals who their original mind made very substantial contribution in Indian political scene. I was privileged to be associated with Rajaji while in Parliament. He was then Home Minister. And I have still to see a greater parliamentarian than Rajaji. With his superb logic and great mastery over language, he was unrivaled in debate. And we always looked forward to his speeches to have something new on every topic that we had to deal with. But it was not only as a parliamentarian that I knew him. It was more as a Gandhian that I was attached to him and drawn to him. You see, Rajaji was drawn to Gandhiji or so to say he recognized the greatness of Gandhiji even before he met Gandhiji. And he was one of the earliest apostles of Gandhiji, if I may say so. But he was not a blind devotee. He never surrendered his judgment, not even to Gandhiji. And in fact, he was one of those very few persons 
who could dare to differ from Gandhiji. And Gandhiji very much respected his advice and judgment. But apart from his political life and social life, he was a man deeply learned in religious and philosophical literature of India. In fact, his works on the Gita, the Upanishads, and particularly Ramayana and Mahabharata are the greatest contribution that he has made to the enrichment of our cultural life. Cutting across the embarrassment which filial love and devotion cause, I venture to describe my father from his childhood to the last phase of his life when he emerged as the sole dissenter. Traditional heritage created in him an inbuilt spirituality. Besides stories covering Rama and Sita, heard by him from his mother and elderly aunts, made a deep impression on his tender mind. In his school and college days, the name of Bala Ganga the Tilak acted like magic on him. Teachings of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and Vivekananda appealed to him. As a very young man, he read the lives of Socrates, Marcus Aurelius, and the works of Thoreau, as well as of Gandhiji. He naturally imbibed the spirit of their teachings. From then on, he became a collaborator with Gandhiji in what may be called the laboratory of Satyagraha. His greatest strength was doing his duty unmindful of the consequences and surrendering results to the great unknown and leaving it to that unknown to sustain him in all his efforts. He ascribed even his longevity to this principle of surrendering everything to God. He preached what he practiced. No wonder he lived a full life and the nation hailed him as the Raja Rishi Janaka of modern times. I met Rajaji about 28 years ago. Uh, he was 81, I was about 26. I'd just been appointed executive secretary of the Swatantra Party. And uh, I had to go to Madras to collect uh, material, come back to Bombay. Thereafter, for the next 12 years, I met him on an average once every two months. And what an experience it was. It was a fantastic experience. Even a five-minute session with him was invigorating, mentally invigorating. Then uh, he had a fantastic memory. He would tell me something two months back. When I called on him again, he would remember and ask me what has happened to it. And many a time I have been caught out. Uh, his instructions are very clear, very precise. And uh, I realize now why the civil service was so fond of him. He would back them, and at the same time, the civil servant knew exactly what they wanted. In a manner of speaking, I was the civil servant in the party. I was an organization man there, and he was my, like a minister, put it that way. A thing that had always uh, been, I feel sorry for after he died was that the moment he died, the, the then establishment claimed Rajaji for his own. During his lifetime, ignoring him and just not listening to his advice and counsel. And I know for a fact, most of us who are associated with him in the last 15 years, know for a fact that his, one, his mental anguish and pain at what was going on. And this was more evident when we had meetings of the national executive. We used to have one every two months or three months, and I used to be invariably present. And what impressed me, apart from his feeling of sorrow at what was going on, was his great addiction for principles, even as a leader of an opposition party, which is a striking contrast, I feel, to what, is, what we see now and what we saw in the recent past. Uh, he rejected this popular uh, notion that opposition should be for opposition's sake. He said, nothing doing, no such thing. Nor did he subscribe to this belief, which is again a very common thing now among opposition people, that any stick is good enough to beat the government with. Okay. 
it was my good fortune to be closely associated with Rajaji from the beginning of the non-cooperation movement in 1920 to the end of his life in 1972. He was a remarkable and versatile personality and during the struggle for freedom and for 25 years after the attainment of freedom, he played so many roles and excelled in each role. In 1922, after the imprisonment of Mahatma Gandhi, many big leaders like Deshabandhu Chitarinjan Das and Pandit Motlal Nehru wanted the Congress to give up the non-cooperation movement and take to agitation through the legislative councils. But Rajaji thought it was loyal, a disloyalty to Mahatma Gandhi and he boldly took up the leadership in the Gaya Congress and defeated all the leaders. Again in 1924, when Mahatma Gandhi issued instructions to all his followers to concentrate on the constructive program. He chose a remote village in Shalom district and established the Gandhi ashram at Tirchangoru and lived there like a Maharshi. He went about in bullock cars to all the villages and did propaganda for prohibition, elimination of untouchability and khadi. I was drawn to Rajaji when I was about 18 years old. Ever since, I was enjoying his abiding affection. I was thus wedded to Rajaji much before I married Swalakshmi. It was God's will and His grace that Swalakshmi and I were close to Rajaji the last many years of his life. I still remember the day in April 1923 when Rajaji came and saw me when I was in the central jail at Trichinopoly during my second imprisonment in the early Gandhian movement. Later, I was working in the Khadi production work at Tirupur. It was Rajaji who sent me in 1926 to Bangalore where the branch of the All India Spinners Association was started. I worked in Bangalore for five years. I believe that I received my true education behind the counter as a salesman of Khadi, and I owe all this to Puji Rajaj. In the year 1971, the latter half of that year, I sought Rajaji's permission to bring out a souvenir, Rajaji 93. He dissuaded me, but I persisted. He then told me, why don't you wait till I get to be 100? I said, you would certainly get to be 100, but where is the guarantee I would survive that long? Then I quoted Churchill. I told Rajaji, when Churchill was 84, many press people went to congratulate him. One bright young journalist asked Churchill, I hope we could go to you again when you hit the century. Churchill looked at the young man from head to foot and said, Oh, you're not a young man, you look healthy enough. Rajaji enjoyed Churchill's reply and gave me permission to print the souvenir. Later, I suggested to Rajaji if you would make a few jottings of some of the important events in his life. Rajaji told me, did Vyasa, Vashishta or Valmiki make any private jottings, keep any papers or maintain any diaries? Who am I before those great sages? Then he clasped my two hands, drew me closer to him and nearly whispered into my ears, Sadashivam. Sadashivam, when I pass away, none need remember me. Little, 
Little did I imagine then that the great man would leave us all and go to the lotus feet of the Lord a year later on, on the Christmas day, December 25, 1972.